everyone. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org. In just a couple of minutes at the top of the hour, I'll be with you to talk bears and salmon as we see them live on the webcams at Brooks River in Katmai National Park. So I'm glad you're joining me today. Once again, I'll be with you live for a play-by-play in just a couple of minutes at the top of the hour. Well, hello, everyone, no matter where you happen to be around the world. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. And welcome to this latest play-by-play broadcast brought to you by Explore.org and Katmai National Park. During this uh, this event, I'll be narrating the bear and salmon activity as we see them live on the webcams at Brooks River in Katmai National Park. I have uh, several webcams out, and so we'll be looking at the, the falls cam. We'll be going down river uh, frequently to look at two different perspective, perspectives on the lower Brooks River, including this uh, wonderful family. I think they'll give us uh, plenty to talk about uh, during the next hour or so. But this is a live broadcast, so we never really know what we're going to see on the webcams. It could be just bears sitting around, but there could be also... Uh, a lot of other uh, activity to to discuss. So I'm glad you're here uh, this evening, and I have a couple of wonderful camera operators who are helping to drive the cameras, alerting me to things that they see uh, to give us some great views of the river. I'm not physically at Brooks River. I'm actually in uh, my own neighborhood, which is uh, currently northern Maine. So it's uh, pitch, pitch black outside right now, uh, but we're still uh, several hours away from sunset at Brooks River on the other side of the continent. And if you're not familiar with Katmai National Park or the location of Brooks River, let's uh, let's take a quick tour here. Brooks River is located in the west central portion of Katmai National Park on the Alaska Peninsula. And Brooks River is about a mile and a half long and it's bisected by Brooks Falls. Along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service, Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams along the river. 
the signal from those cameras is sent to two radio repeaters on the top of Dumpling Mountain, and then those repeaters send the signal wirelessly to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away, and that's where it gets uh, hooked up to the rest of the internet. Going back to the river for just a second, uh, on today's broadcast, we'll be looking at the falls camera once again. So that's would be um, the star on the left side of the screen. And then also the river watch camera and the lower river camera. So both of those uh, cameras uh, we'll be looking at from time to time too. And I also have several questions uh, queued up uh, depending on what the bear activity is like, hopefully we'll work those into the broadcast. Those are submitted in advance using the Ask Your Bear Cam question form. You can find a link to that in the featured comment at the bottom of the page uh, on the Brooks live, live chat channel on Explore.org. And thanks to everybody who donated to the Otis Fund over the past uh, month. It's It's been incredibly successful. Uh, recently, we reached our goal of $100,000 and Explore.org will match the, that donation up to hundred grand. So you just raised uh, $200,000 in total for the Katmai Conservancy, which is the French group for Katmai National Park. Uh, so I'm very heartened by everyone's generosity. Uh, it means a lot to me. It means a lot, even more importantly, it means a lot to the bears. Uh, so I sleep a, a little better at night knowing that there are so many people out there who, who care about Brooks River just as, just as much as I do. So thank you once again for that. But let's take a look around the river here for just a moment and see uh, who's doing what for the, for the moment. It looks like we have a, a younger bear uh, that's been hanging out on this rock for a period of time. This is uh, number 908, I believe. Uh, she's a bear that was born uh, just a few years ago. Uh, so it's not quite an adult bear, still in that independent juvenile stage. We call those bears sub-adults. And uh, this is the spot that this bear went to with uh, her mother frequently as a cub. Um, her mother is using the river. Uh, that's uh, number 708, Amelia. And Amelia actually has a couple of cubs this year. It's possible we might see them on the broadcast. I'm not sure if that's um, if she's going to make an appearance, of course, or not. But uh, this is a spot that Amelia occasionally uh, uses. And... I mean, you know, I always kind of wonder whether bears, you know, find comfort in places that they visited in the past. I certainly think they find comfort when they're able to experience uh, places that can give them access to a lot of food and if they can find food in those locations. So, so maybe perhaps sitting on this rock, looking down onto the water, not only does this bear have a better perspective looking down onto the water, maybe able to pounce on fish that will swim right in front of it. Uh, but they're also... I, I, I can't discount any possibility that there, there could be um, some other level of comfort going on in this bear's mind right now. So this is the Brooks Falls camera that we're looking at. I'm sure our camera operators will pan towards the falls where there are a couple of other bears uh, fishing uh, recently. We're going to go down river though. The, the, the lower river area right now, really, if you're a bear, is where it's at at this time of the year. This is where the salmon are accumulating after they spawn and they finish, um, after they finish spawning, the skin, they die. There's no returning to the ocean for them. So once they enter fresh water, it's basically a one-way trip for them. And we find uh, when salmon, after they spawn and die in large numbers, the lower river attracts uh, a large number of, of bears. The structure uh, on the left side, upper left side of the screen is a wildlife viewing platform. That's what um, visitors and tourists and rangers and uh, people like myself will, will utilize to watch bears at the river during this, the tourist season. And Brooks River is never officially closed to people, uh, but right now there's no facilities open at Brooks River. No one's uh, flying uh, planes out to the river right now. Um, and there's no water taxi to the to the river, so access is pretty difficult. You basically would have to have your own boat uh, or plane, for example, to fly it in. So, not really, uh, no one's really visiting the river at this time of the year. So, if you catch a glimpse of the bridge or the wildlife viewing platforms, they're going to be empty at this time of the year. Uh, but the river is still full of bears. Um, in fact, you know, it's. I mean, we're approaching the. Uh, you know, the end of October, we're almost there right now, beginning of November. 
And we're still seeing a lot of bears at the river. And I think that has to do with um, the number of salmon that uh, utilize the river this year. It's been able to, uh, there's been a lot of food around that's kept the bears in the vicinity. And that was actually, uh, as we take a, a different look at the same family uh, on our, our on our lower river camera, that was actually a question that came up in um, the bear camp question form. Earlier uh, this week, uh, Kathy asked, does this year's abundance of fish impact when the bears go into hibernation? And do they fish longer? Will they hibernate earlier? And, you know, it, de it, it depends, Kathy, on each one of the bears uh, and their their health, their fitness, their hunger level, their energy needs. As we look at this family right here, and this is um, number 273 and her uh, yearling cubs, she actually has three of them. One just wandered a short distance away. As we look at this family here, it, it seems like, you know, just from my anecdotal perspective, watching the cameras and it, this, uh, when you watch the cameras, you're not getting a systematic you know, view of the river because the camera doesn't see the whole perspective of the river at the same time. But it does seem like there are a high proportion of mother bears with cubs, a high proportion of bear families still at the river, especially compared to uh, other classes of bears. Uh, so adult males, single adult females, we still have a lot of subadults on the river, but it seems like uh, compared to what we find earlier in the summer, there's definitely a higher proportion of families still on the river. And I think that might be because some of those other bears can uh, you know, gain the fat reserves that they deem necessary to survive winter hibernation just a little bit easier than mothers and cubs. Mothers, are, you know, are not only eating for themselves, but they're eating to protect, uh, you know, of course, their offspring. They need to spend a lot of time in, uh, in vigilance behaviors, looking for threats. And so they're devoting a lot of energy to, their, to raising their offspring. And that makes it more difficult for mother bears to gain fat reserves compared to an adult male, you know, a big adult male sitting up at Brooks Falls all summer, uh, like a couple of them that we'll pan to real quickly, you know, they don't have to, these two bears don't have to worry about anyone but themselves. So they're up there, they're fishing for salmon, gaining, um, you know, the body mass that they need and devoting those calories that they, they intake uh, solely to um, their own survival. But a mother bear like 273, who's in the middle right here, uh, resting her head on one of her cubs, you know, she, she's eating, she's uh, for herself, she's trying to gain her own, uh, uh, own body fat, but she's also nursing her cubs from time to time. So she's devoting a lot of energy into milk production, especially in the springtime when there's not a lot to eat. She's sustaining her cubs um, growth at that time of the year. So I think it, it seems like, and again, I, I'm not sure if this is uh, you know, a scientifically um, accurate statement, but it does seem like you know, we have a higher proportion of mother bears on the river right now uh, because they have a, maybe a harder time in gaining those um, calories necessary to survive winter hibernation. But the availability of food, to go back to, to Kathy's question, you know, really does uh, help dictate, you know, when, when bears go into hibernation. Brown bears are not obligate hibernators. So it's not like a ground squirrel, for instance, we we'll take a different perspective here. We'll look at uh, one of 273's cubs just w out walking around. This is just downstream of the view we were looking at before, just from the looking at the other side of the river. When you think about Arctic ground squirrels, they are obligate hibernators. They must hibernate. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a choice that they have. Hives. But um, both brown and black bears don't need to hibernate. They uh, can remain active all winter in the right conditions, if the, the climate is mild enough and if they have at least some access to food during winter times. But still, hibernation is an unconscious choice in these bears. Even if bears are remaining active um, throughout the winter, uh, their metabolism is usually greatly slowed down by then. So they may, bears, one of the unique things about bear hybrid is that um, they're not, uh, they, they, they retain, I should say, the ability to uh, get up, walk around, um, so they may have a greatly reduced metabolism, uh, a greatly reduced, uh, you know, or no appetite in the winter time. If they're in a fully hibernative mode, they don't have an appetite. Uh, but but brown bears and and some black bears in southern parts of the United States um, can remain active year round, and even in, in far northern climates uh, where 
Um, you know, if you're exposed to the to the seacoast off of the coast of Alaska, some bears can remain active. That happens on Kodiak Island, where there's at least a few adult males every year that remain out of dens all winter. They're not really eating a whole lot. They're, uh, you know, they're not, <laughs> they're doing a lot of this. They're just kind of like laying around, um, you know, is mostly sub- surviving on their fat reserves, but they can't remain active uh, all year. I think a lot of the, uh, the the bigger adult males have maybe moved on to other areas at Brooks River or, or from Brooks River, other areas in Katmai National Park where they might try to uh, find some very late runs of spawning salmon or, you know, maybe they're just wandering towards their, their denning sites. But on average, Adult males are the last to go into de- into their dens. It's really uh, pregnant females who go into the dens first. So we're not really seeing a lot of single adult females at the river this year. And that's because uh, uh, they could be going to just different places to fish. Or, you know, some of those uh, single adult females that we're watching this summer could be pregnant. Um, so they need to head to their den sites and get, to, get into their dens a little bit earlier uh, to begin to gestate their cubs compared to um, adult males like we're, like the ones that we're seeing right here. So Brooks Falls, like I mentioned before, is not one of the best places to fish at this time of the year, just because the salmon are no longer migrating upstream. Uh, There's fewer and fewer salmon available to the bears in the river because most of them have already spawned. So the bears are really just um, scavenging scraps for the time being. But every once in a while, there could be a fresher fish that is navigating those um, those shallows below Brooks Falls. And that's what these, these bears are looking for. They're really looking for uh, fish that are not dead. They're looking for some more, some livelier fish. And that can help them um, gain a few extra calories compared to the dead fish. When salmon first arrive in Brooks River, uh, a sockeye salmon, for instance, which is the vast majority of the salmon that live in Brooks River, uh, a sockeye salmon contains about 4,500 calories of digestible energy for a brown bear. And that's in late June and early July. But after they spend months in fresh water, they expend a tremendous amount of energy migrating and a tremendous amount of energy spawning. The amount of digestible energy within that salmon, right, right after it's done spawning and it dies, is probably about half what it was in early summer, maybe even less. And so when bears are scavenging a dead fish, they're really not getting the same amount of calories that they would um, early in the in the summer. Uh, so if you're a bear, you know, sitting at Brooks Falls, maybe you're looking to recoup, uh, you know, some of those missing calories. It's very easy to scavenge dead salmon, like I mentioned at the at the lower river uh, at this time of the year. But you know, I also wonder if those those dead fish uh, how they taste, and maybe um, some bears prefer uh, a fresher catch. It will definitely give them an opportunity uh, to gain. Uh, more calories. Bear in the foreground there, you know, with it uh, creeping forward like that, I think it probably spotted a fish in the shallows there. So maybe just looking um, to get into a better position. Uh, The salmon in this, in in this area, in this far pool of Brooks Falls, near those boulders in that conveyor belt area, uh, have a real hard time spotting predators. Uh, The water's filled with the air bubbles. Uh, The water's shallow, so it's harder for salmon to get a purchase. Uh, and push off in the water using their tails. Salmon are very powerful swimmers, but um, yeah, it, they, they're vulnerable in this spot, and the bears know that. And that's why we have these bears um, both in these uh, locations here. A little bit of an interaction going on there. Um, the bear in the foreground that just moved off of the off of the screen to the right that was out uh, number eight one two. So he's a young adult male, and. He's not nearly fully grown. I mean, he still has a lot of, of growing to do. And the, and the bear that uh, moved a little bit closer to him, that A12 avoided, I'm not completely sure of its ID, but it looks like it could be number 602. Uh, again, not positive on that, uh, on that ID, but that's a bear that's um, around the same age, but a little bit older, if I remember correctly, uh, than A12. And this is how most of these interactions between bears end up playing out. Um, they simply just kind of avoid one another as, as best they can. Especially when you're a younger bear, ordinate bear, you're a smaller bear, you recognize, hey, if another bigger bear is coming towards me, uh, it's just not worth it to try to stay on my ground because I am unlikely to win that battle if it comes to a physical confrontation. So bears do get in fights. They definitely do. We see that on the cameras, especially early in the salmon run when bears are particularly hungry and there's not uh, 
and the, and the salmon are just arriving and the bears can, are competing for the most preferred fishing spots. But at this time of the year, you know, uh, salmon are so dispersed throughout the river that it's, it's much more likely that bears are just going to avoid one another and go to different spots. So as these bears up at the falls, Dokusi Do, will head back down river. 273 is up from her short nap. Looking uh, in the water. If she goes into the water, her cubs may continue to rest on the uh, on the bank until their 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 hunger pangs uh, overtake them, and they're going to go into the water and try to fish uh, with with mother. Mother bears really don't necessarily share their their catch with their cubs. You know, a salmon is fairly small meal for, for a brown bear. And I've seen mother bears eat a whole salmon in less than 40 seconds. So that, I mean, that's a lot of food to put down. You put down a five pound salmon in 40 seconds uh, that can help to, <laughs> to demonstrate just how, how profound their, their hunger is. But a lot of times mother bears are tolerant of letting their cubs take salmon away from them. So a mother bear might, you know, be eating her fish. And so let cubs, you know, or her cubs rip the, uh, pieces of the fish away. But usually mother bears aren't going to bring the cubs or excuse me, the, the fish to the bank or drop the fish in front of uh, the cub and say, here, kid, have some food. It's not like, uh, you know, a, a mother bird, for instance, um, you know, a songbird. If you have a robin that's nesting in a tree, it's uh, for a couple of weeks, it's bringing food um, to, to its chicks after they hatch because they're completely helpless. At that time, but it's really up to these um, to these young bears to follow their mother to places where they find food, and um, and in the case of of salmon, get food from mother. And if you're a more assertive cub, or maybe uh, a more dominant cub, then you can um, sometimes gain access to more food resources uh, by doing that. This year, though, you know, uh, salmon were incredibly abundant on the river. So the bears are very well fed and we're not really seeing examples of, of runts like we uh, sometimes see with large litters. Uh, with litters of three uh, cubs or particularly four cubs, there's often one cub that's, that's smaller than the rest. And maybe it just has a harder time getting to mother's milk, a harder time getting to the food uh, because uh, its siblings bully it away from, the, from those um from those resources. We really didn't see that this year. That could be just coincidence. It could just be based on genetics too. And each one of the, um, you know, uh, the cubs having the right genes to grow uh, at about the same rate. But I also think certainly that the, uh, the prodigious salmon run that the area experienced this year certainly helped. I'm going to head back up the Brooks Falls here for just a moment. Looking downstream, this is a perspective that we haven't seen um, during this broadcast uh, today. A couple water droplets on the camera housing right now. It's been a cool, uh, drizzly day in in Katmai. There's a bit, of, there's a touch of snow on the mountains. If um, you know, if the, if the sky is clear and you get a look at Dumpling Mountain or Mount Katolanat uh, on the cams, you can see uh, a dusting of snow. So um, winter time is fast approaching. This area right now, and that brings me, I think, to a topic that I wanted to cover. I know a lot of people have been wondering about this uh, for the past, you know, month and a half or so, and I really was uh, looking for a good opportunity. You know, during one of the, you know, final at least play-by-play uh, -play broadcasts for the year to talk about where bears to go to, to hibernate. The, the bears that we see at the falls, they'll be de um, on this camera right now. They're going to be departing the river fairly soon. The family that we're looking at downstream, 273 and her cubs, they're going to be departing the river fairly soon. But a lot of people are wondering, you know, where will they, where will they go overall? And when will they begin to hibernate? I covered that just a little bit at the, um, earlier in the broadcast, but I think it's worth um, going over once again. The bears, uh, you know, in Katmai will start to hibernate in November uh, on average. Uh, pregnant females are the first bears to go into the den. And uh, then it's a, a mix of subadult bears, um, non-pregnant females, family groups. 
the last bears typically to enter the den is or are the adult males. Um, but that's not a, a well that that averages are those averages are true for brown bears and and grizzly bears across North America, there's always a few adult males that den before all the females are in their den. So, um, you know, by the end of November, you just can't say, well, all the, it, it just must be adult males, adult males wandering around if any are still active. There could still could be some family groups around. There could still be some single females around. Um, but on average, most of those will be in the dens by then. It'll be only, you know, uh, the, the largest group of bears remaining out of the dens by the end of November will be uh, adult males. And that was a question that actually came in through, and I apologize if I don't pronounce your name correctly, but um, Chiara. And uh, Tracy was wondering what qualities make a good den. So let me queue up some photos here. You're wondering, you know, why the camera, or not the camera work, the camera work is, um, the excellent camera work is done by a couple of volunteer camera operators. But if you're wondering why the transitions between cameras and maybe some photographs are a little shoddy. That's because I'm the producer <laughs> of the broadcast. But I wanted to bring this picture into um, our discussion when we're talking about where bears go to den and what the qualities of a good den, because this is uh, about the habitat that bears are going to when they, they make their dens. This spot actually is a little bit rocky. This is Dumpling Mountain. This is just north of, um, of, of Brooks River. So when you're watching the lower river cameras, uh, especially the river watch camera, um, and it uh, looks up river and you see a mountain on the horizon on the right side of the, the screen, that's a uh, dumpling mountain. Uh, so bears are looking really for uh, a Goldilocks zone of conditions. They're looking for uh, habitat that catches a lot of snow uh, to help insulate the entrance to their dens. They're looking for steep slopes so they can dig straight into the hillside. And they're also looking for well vegetated slopes. Um, the roots help to stabilize the structure of the den itself. And um, just uphill a little ways, maybe a, a third of a mile or so, half a kilometer, something like that, um, from this last picture, but um, looking at a south-facing slope, the couple of holes right in the center of that, um, at, of that photograph are old bear dens on Dumpling Mountain. And this is a picture that I took in May. And you can see towards the top of the photo, a couple of um, patches of snow still lingering there. And this is a very steep slope. This is something probably like a 30 degree slope, 20 degree slope or something like that. So very steep. A bear doesn't have to dig down. It just has to dig straight into the hillside. Um, this is the really typical habitat for, um, for bears to den uh, on Dumpling Mountain. And this is that end that I found on the other side of the north side of Dumpling Mountain to give you a closer perspective of what that looks like. Again, bears digging straight into the hillside, well-vegetated slopes. The inside of this den was barren, except for just roots and rocks. Uh, you can see all of the, the roots from the, from the perennial plants uh, hanging down in the ceiling. This is a fairly large den. Um, it was very easy for me to squat inside of it. I don't have a picture of myself inside of this uh, particular den, but I have a picture of myself at the entrance of another den on um, Dumpling Mountain. This is actually, I took this one over 10 years ago now. I can't believe that. Um, I'm still just as spry as I ever was in this photograph. Um, so don't, don't worry about that, folks. But uh, yeah, this is a, a den on Dumpling Mountain. Just to give you a, a, an example of how big the entrance of, that, of, of the den is. And uh, bear dens usually have a tunnel that goes back um, several feet into these hillsides. Uh, and then there's a sleeping chamber in the back, and that's what this photograph is right here, just, uh, just a sleeping chamber. So the, again, the qualities of a good den, looking for these steep, well-vegetated hillsides that collect and hold a lot of snow. Um, and was wondering, do bears go to the same dens each year? And they probably don't in Katmai, uh, just because the soils don't hold up over the summertime. Uh, to support like a permanent den. However, bears are probably going to go back to areas where, um, where they know they can find good denning sites. They seem to have uh, a fidelity to uh, particular denning areas. So a lot of bears on, on Kodiak Island, for instance, have been tracked to go back to their denning, uh, to at least win a kilometer of their old den sites. Um, so, so they will go back to the same area, but they probably are not entering the same den. They're probably digging a new den each year. Uh, 
And Hazel was wondering, is there competition for primodensites? And there really isn't. Uh, just because that habitat across Katmai is really widespread. This is just a, 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 where the X's are. This is a few examples of, of where bears uh, from the river have gone to den over the years. The ones that are farther away uh, were tracked um, or were determined um, by a radio collaring study done in the 1970s. Uh, at Brooks River, uh, the yellow hand-drawn arrow there on this Google Earth image uh, points to Brooks River. So bears can travel maybe 40 miles or more from Brooks River to their denning sites. Uh, with this current, you know, the current generations of bears at Brooks River, we really don't know where they're going to den. Um, but you can rest assured that they're probably going to places like what we find on Dumpling Mountain. So these steep, again, well-vegetated slopes. Um, not, But there's there's ample denning habitat in the park. So bears are unlikely to, uh, to feel any need to compete for these spaces. So more active behavior from our bears um, on the river right now. Going back to our river watch camera. So this is uh, looking upstream. So water, water is flowing towards um, the cave now. Still, you know, plenty of uh, younger bears on the river. Oh, and I, I do want to cut up uh, back to the falls here real quick because we do have, um, looks like Amelia and her cub. Remember I mentioned um, and one of her cubs at least, or both of them, yes. Yeah, both of them are right there. Uh, I mentioned 708 and Amelia earlier uh, today. Um, at the beginning of the broadcast, we were looking at 908 sitting on the rock. Well, this is, um, this is uh, 908's mother, so this is 708 Amelia. Two very differently colored cubs. We just got a glimpse of them because I cut to them a little bit late. Um, one browner and then one dark brown. Uh, and we see that uh, occasionally, uh, it's not uncommon to see that in, in, in bear cubs uh, to have different fur colors. And just like in people, fur color uh, on, in brown bears is genetically uh, determined. Uh, and it's, it's possible that... Um, you know, the cubs, although we don't know, it's possible that they could have um, different fathers. Uh, during the mating season in, uh, in late summer, female bears will mate with multiple males. Males will seek out as many different um, females as, as they can find. So the bears are uh, promiscuous, uh, you know, during the mating season. And female bears are also induced ovulators, meaning that they, they don't ovulate their eggs until um, they couple with an adult male, or perhaps at least are exposed to an adult male. Scientists really aren't sure uh, what triggers induced ovulation in brown bears, but there's really good evidence that it does happen. Uh, so it's possible that um, you know when you're seeing a family of bears that they could have different fathers, although none of the genetic evidence done on the bears at Brooks River in the past has confirmed um, any evidence of multiple paternities. For, uh, for a litter of brown bears. So it could happen, but at least at Brooks River, it seems to be at least uh, un uncommon. It's only been documented elsewhere. So good look at that family. Amelia is a bit cryptic in the, in the fall. You know, we don't really see her very often. We used to see her all the time in the lower river, uh, right where this, you know, this bear is uh, feeding right now, for example. You know, Amelia was one of those bears that um, we saw in the lower river all the time. When I was, um, I'm no longer a ranger at Katmai, but I, I was a ranger there for a long time. And in 2007, 2008, 2009, of uh, my first few years as a ranger there, everyone knew who Amelia was. Um, the, the, the visitors knew her because she was always in the camp area. The lodge employees knew her because she was always in the camp area. The rangers knew her because she was always in the camp area near the building. She seemed to be um, very habituated to the presence of people. Uh, but she's really changed her habits since that time and now um, to utilize those areas. Maybe she was just forced to use the area near Brooks Lodge during the tourist um, season because that was the only habitat available to her. She was willing to tolerate the presence of people uh, because uh, she wanted to avoid you know, competition with other bears. Maybe now as an older bear, a more experienced bear, a larger bear, she's able to find space elsewhere along the river. But this, uh, you know, her story really isn't that uncommon. These younger bears that we're looking at on the Riverwatch camera right now 
are, uh, it could be experiencing, um, you know, similar pressures, not pressures from people at the moment, um, because there are very few people at, at Brooks River. Uh, but in the middle of summer, when there are more bears on the river, and when there are um, maybe greater numbers of, of people, the dynamic of where bears um, go on the river uh, can be quite different. You know, we'll find the adult males dominating access to the best fishing spots up at Brooks Falls, and many of the uh, younger and smaller bears relegated to less productive um, fishing areas downstream. And a lot of those bears will be um, utilizing the lower river areas, not because it's a good place to fish in July. Typically, it's not. We had, we had some exceptions to that this year just because of the number of salmon. But typically in a, in a, in a year where there's not a whole lot of salmon uh, or a, a more average salmon run, I should say, when you get maybe you know a, mil- uh, a million fish in the Naknek River watershed, perhaps 200 or 300,000 in Brooks River, the fishing in the lower river area where this bear is right now, not that great. In, in July. So a lot of these other bears are relegated to, again, those less productive um, fishing spots. This spot where this bear is walking right now, right off of, of this grassy island, has been a very popular place for bears to fish over the last uh, two months or more. Salmon really seem to be collecting in that deep pool right below where that bear is looking now. And you can see you know, bits of fish carcasses. Uh, those are lighter specks on, on the grassy bank. Evidence of how frequently um, bears have utilized uh, this spot. If you were to go to Brooks River tomorrow and for some reason the bears would just vanish, uh, you would find evidence of bears all over the place. You would find beaten down grass, fish heads everywhere, piles of scat, marking trees. And, and that was really one of the first things that I can remember about Brooks River uh, and going there during my, maybe my first week or two at Brooks River in 2007. Is that I didn't see hardly, I saw hardly any bears there at that time of the year. It was May, not a lot of reason for bears to, be, to gather there, but I saw signs of bears everywhere. And that'll last, um, you know, throughout the fall months. In fact, let me cut to a video here. We'll take a look. This is um, along the banks of the lower river in uh, early November. I took this uh, in 2014, but you're looking at just the remnants of fish heads. Each one of those um, fish heads is or was once connected to a body. The body is no longer there because a bear ate it. Just thousands of these littering the riverbank uh, at, at this time of the year. And this was a season, sometimes, again, people will ask, does, it, does the river stink because of all the, the dead fish? And, you know, early in the summer, it really doesn't. Uh, of course, the bear scat can stink. But most of the time, you know, you don't really notice too much. At least I didn't. But yeah, come the end of the middle of um, the end into October, certainly through the middle of October, yeah, it gets pretty stinky along the river with all the dead fish. This bear right now looking for, again, dead and dying salmon, looking for anything they can't swim away. Really a typical um, example of snorkeling behavior. We have been seeing some bears lunging after salmon. Um, and that indicates to me that the amount of dead salmon in the river, or at least um, freshly dead salmon, if there is such a thing, the amount of those uh, fish are getting fewer and fewer. So bears are maybe looking uh, or willing to expend a little bit more energy chasing some, some uh, half-live fish. And if you joined the broadcast late, I'd like to welcome you to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. My name is Mike Fitz. I'm the resident naturalist with Explore.org and also former park ranger at Katmai. And I'm very thankful uh, for the opportunity that Explore.org has provided me to continue to share uh, my knowledge and love of this place with everybody. So I'm glad you're joining me today. I'll be with you to uh, talking about bears and salmon here on the webcams uh, until the top 
of it. Looking at uh, number 908 here, still on uh, her rock downstream of the falls. We missed it earlier because I was uh, talking about something else, but she did pounce into the water and, and catch a salmon uh, during the broadcast. So, you know, again, it can look like she's not paying attention. It looks like maybe she's uh, just kind of daydreaming there. But no, they, the bears are often very focused on, on um, the task at hand. And, and often if, if they're not sleeping, you know, at this time of the year, it's, it's focused on finding food. They're still experiencing, uh, many of them are still experiencing what is called hyperphagia. That's a, an annual phase in their life where the normal feelings of fullness or, you know, a normal feeling of satiation that accompanies a big meal that is switched off in a brown bear at this time of the year. So they're resistant to the effects of hormones that um, suppress appetite, uh, like leptin, for example. Uh, so they feel hungry all the time. And that's an adaptation that allows them uh, to continue to eat uh, and gain the fat reserves, again, that are so vital to their wintertime uh, survival. Bears uh, aren't going to the den to avoid cold necessarily. They're going to the dens to avoid uh, famine. If they could find enough food, they could potentially stay active again all, all year. Um, but really it's, it's famine, the lack of food for these omnivores that, uh, that drives them to their den. And as we look at number uh, 908 here, just sitting on her rock, uh, another, another question, you know, kind of regarding a uh, hibernation in the bears here at the river, Roy asked, how do individual bears know when to hibernate? And it's, it's again, it's, a, it's an individual unconscious decision that, that happens in each bear, probably, you know, probably somewhat tied to body fat, but it's also tied to um, other rhythms, hormonal changes that happen within the bear. Weather and daylight also is a factor. Um, the onset of cold weather has been correlated with um, with the time that bears enter their dens. Um, that was uh, first sort of documented in Yellowstone by um, John and Frank Craighead during their pioneering uh, bearst in the 1960s, but it's um, it's been co that that correlation has been corroborated in um, subsequent studies. Uh, so in years where the weather turns colder, maybe there's uh, less food available. Um, if, if the weather turns colder earlier in the fall, uh, that bears may just say, you know what, it's not worth me going for more food. I'm just going to cut my losses. I'm going to go into the den. Uh, but there's again also hormonal changes. They also experience sort of like a circ annual rhythm uh, that that tells them, hey, it's it's time to go into into the den. And it looks like maybe uh, maybe two seven three here, we, we, who we were looking at earlier in the broadcast, has moved upstream. Unless this is an, another family group, hard for me to identify when they're walking away like this. Uh, and I think maybe this is a different family, just a mother in uh, her two cubs. Cubs of this size, when they're when they're yearlings and two and a half year olds, so when they're in their second or third summer, they're often experiencing their last summer with mother. And uh, so the lessons that they they gain with mom are going to be put to use very quickly um, coming uh, next year. This could be number uh, seven one nine. I'm not again. I'm not hundred percent sure on that. But she, if it is, she's a young mother uh, raising her first. Uh, litter of cubs with yearlings this year. 
But there's also been an unidentified um, mother with two um, yearlings on the river. So it could be um, that bear. But anyway, this is a, this is a mother bear with, with older cubs. So again, um, you know, these cubs could be experiencing their last summer with mother. We could see them uh, back on their own here at the river next year. A lot of times, especially with, um, with females, they tend to establish a home range that partly overlaps with their mother. Uh, male bears are much more likely to disperse away from their mother's home ranges. That's not always the case. We definitely know of adult male bears at the river that were raised here and they still encounter their mother um, during, this, during the summer. But it's, it's certainly more likely uh, for a male bear to disperse um, away from their mother's home range than, um, than a female. Well, I talked about how bears are hungry at this time of the year. They're focused on gaining food. They still have the energy from time to time to engage in other activities. And we do see the bears at Brooks River expressing a lot of uh, social behaviors, behaviors that indicate that, you know, they're, uh, they're well adapted to um, communicating with one another, to getting along with one another in a crowded space especially in a year when there's ample food available to the bears. So just as I cut to this scene, uh, a little bit of, of play uh, happening between, uh, between two of those bears. So even though bears might be very hungry at this time of the year, uh, they, they can still find, you know, uh, some time to engage in, in other behaviors. But the pursuit of food is really going to be the overwhelming drive. Uh, at this time of the year. just for a moment, taking a look at our other cameras to see what's happening. A lot of bears moving around uh, right now. You know, at the beginning of the broadcast, we had bears that were pretty stationary, but it seems like they're all their appetites have picked up. They're all looking around for um, feeding opportunities. So from our lower river camera, several bears in view there, several bears in view on our uh, river watch camera. This is on the opposite side of the river from the lower river camera. Again, bears looking around, moving around, looking for anything that can't swim away. And just looking at this scene right now, it's clearly evident if you were watching the cameras um, a week ago, two weeks ago, uh, how much lower the water level is in the uh, in the mouth area of Brooks River. Brooks River ends really uh, just to the left of this view, another few hundred yards. Uh, it empties into uh, Naknek Lake, and the level of Naknek Lake, how full that basin is, really kind of determines the amount of, of water that's in the the lower. Um, lower Brooks River area. But when we start to see the water level in the lower river um, drop, that's an indication that there's, uh, that Naknek Lake, of course, is lowering too. But really, the that ultimately means that the glaciers uh, on the volcanoes that feed into uh, Naknek Lake uh, are starting to freeze uh, for the year. There's far less runoff uh, on them. And the, the mountaintops are receiving uh, snow instead of rain. So there's less, um, you know, snow melt, or excuse me, yes, yeah, snow melt and in rain running into the basin overall. And this is a very, it can be a very different scene uh, come February and March. Uh, the water level uh, can be several feet lower 
uh, than it is right now. And it's not an exaggeration uh, to say that uh, the level of Naknek Lake can fluctuate from its uh, springtime low to its late summer high, anywhere from like six to eight feet. Just depending on how much precipitation, how much runoff, how much glacier melt is uh, is going into the basin itself. So we're seeing more of the grassy banks exposed, more gravel bars exposed along the river. And that's certainly an indication of change. It's, a, it's an indication that winter is, um, is nearly upon uh, Katmai and the season of plenty for these bears is, is certainly coming to an end. I'm going to head back up to Brooks Falls here, looking at a different bear uh, sitting in the water, licking his lips there. This to me, this bear looks a lot like number 503. 503 is a bear that I enjoy watching. He has a fairly unique story. Uh, he was separated or uh, emancipated really from his mother as a yearling, but he was subsequently adopted by another bear, uh, another mother bear that summer. So he had um, two more years with, uh, with a different mother, 435 Holly, grew into a very large um, sub-adult bear and is now quickly growing into a very large adult male, even though he is only about, well, her, um, in, uh, at the end of January, he'll be um, eight, he'll be eight years old. So, yeah, he still has a lot of growing to do. Um, but he's one of those bears that we we see expressing a high level of tolerance for other bears, a lot of playfulness uh, towards other bears. He seems to have a knack at uh, avoiding at least confrontation at the falls, even sometimes getting some of the more dominant males to tolerate his close proximity. So 503 is a great bear to watch. I'm very curious to see how he behaves as he matures into a fully grown adult. And that's not going to be for a few more years. Typically, you know, adult males in, in Katmai, they don't reach their full size as far as like length and height until they're like 10, 12 years old, something like that. Uh, their skull size doesn't reach, you know, within a, a you know, maybe 90%, 97% or so of their, of its maximum width, uh, until, you know, they're around, you know, around 10 years of age or so, but their body mass can continue. They can continue to uh, gain body mass for several, uh, more years after that, especially as they become more dominant and are able to access, uh, the best fishing spots at places like, like Brooks Falls. So 503 really does have the potential um, to grow into a very large bear. He comes from a very large mother. Um, his uh, biological mother, number 402, is one of the bigger adult females at Brooks River consistently from year to year. So we know he has at least um, her genes in, in her, the potential to grow very large. We don't know who his father is. He's also a really skilled angler. Um, he'll fish near that rock that he was sitting at on the far side, uh, but he loves the jacuzzi. Occasionally, we'll see him on the lip as well. So fairly diverse in his um, in his fishing opportunities or fishing uh, techniques and in places. When we see bears moving from one spot to another at the falls fairly quickly, that means they're probably, they probably have a good idea that they're not going to find one great opportunity in any one spot. So they're just uh, looking for salmon in different places. The jacuzzi where that bear had entered just a moment ago, that big plunge pool below Brooks Falls is a great place to fish when the salmon are migrating. But when the, when the salmon stop migrating, like they, uh, which they're no longer doing right now, it's it's it, it's not as productive. So again, snorkeling, looking for things that can't swim away, scavenging for dead salmon, those are going to be the more lucrative opportunities in October.
good examples here of how just just how easy it is to scavenge uh, dead salmon. These bears just in an eddy of the river, a slow moving portion of the river where there's a deeper pocket of water, salmon uh, collect there. Uh, so this is a spot where bears on our on the lower river camera, river watch camera, you'll see them in this spot frequently picking up, um, you know, bits of salmon, whole salmon heads, partially eaten salmon. Still many gulls along Brooks River uh, for this time of the year. I think that's also, uh, again, an indication of how, how large the salmon run was. Uh, they still might be feeding on salmon eggs. We're not really seeing them bobbing in the water like they were before. Uh, two weeks ago, you would have seen a lot of uh, gulls, you know, diving as best they could into the water um, and bobbing their heads in the water to pick up sand eggs. Not as much of that right now, though. I think that's an indication, again, that most of the salmon are done spawning. There's not a lot of free eggs drifting in the water. So the, the gulls are just looking for, for scraps of fish that the bears happen to leave behind. So going back up to the falls here, this again is 503. If my ID of this bear is correct, if this is 503, we can see that he's a, a tubby guy. Definitely has a good bit of fat reserves on him. But not nearly as fat as the fully grown adult males at the river. That's not surprising given um, this bear's age, relative age or so. Again, presuming that my ID is um, is correct, it, younger bears are not just devoting energy to their body mass, but also grow, growing their 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 overall frame, so their skeletal structure. So we're seeing, you know, these younger bears in their subadult years, their young adult years, growing longer and taller as well as fatter. While a bear like the, the fully grown adult males, like um, 747, who is this year's Fat Bear Week uh, champion, you know, he, he's not growing taller or longer. He's just getting fatter each year. So he's just putting all of that energy into his body mass. We'll head back down river here for just a few moments, um, a gathering of bears uh, upstream from the river watch camera. Again, a really lucrative place for bears to fish. Bears are a lot of things. Uh, I said it during the last play-by-play, -play, but they are certainly opportunists. They have um, long memories associated with uh, food, locations where they can find food. Even specific places at the river, uh, they can remember. Uh, so you're up at the falls, for example, you can see that when a bear goes to the exact same fishing position, um, fishing spot that it had the year before, stands in the exact same way. We see that in the lower river where bears will frequently investigate the same uh, nooks on the lower river. And that's an adaptation that has helped bears survive uh, throughout their evolutionary history, likely, because they do live in a, in a feast or famine world. Summertime is a time of feasting for them, but wintertime is a time of famine. For them and their curiosity, their ability to remember where food is, has again served them very well over their uh, over their evolutionary history. Recently, though, that's uh, you know brought them into some um, into gotten them into uh, some conflict with people uh, because those same traits that help them to survive in nature. If they, for example, find unsecured garbage or uh, a bird feeder that's been left out uh, too long or at the time of the year where um, when bears are active or pet food that's left outside 
Uh, bears are unlikely to forget those food sources uh, just as much as they were unlikely to forget a, uh, you know, the location of a good fishing spot in the river. Thankfully, in Katmai National Park, um, strict regulations regarding food storage prevent bears from associating us from with with food. That's a long story that we can try to get into in some other time. It wasn't always like that at Brooks River, but the National Park Service and the rangers do a very good job. And everyone who visits the park does a very good job, on average, of keeping, keeping bears away from food. Uh, but in other parts of North America, that's not the case. Um, you know, black bears and even grizzly bears uh, and brown bears can still get into um, food that's left unsecured. Uh, so if you're living in bear country, yeah, please make sure that you um, keep um, – as much food and garbage inside secure that uh, from, from curious bears because they're going to look to exploit the easiest feeding opportunities that they can find. Bears are just being bears. So we can't blame them for doing what they're doing. That's just how they make a living. I think we owe it to them to make sure that they're focusing on uh, the foods that they can find in nature and not the easy meals um, that we might accidentally provide to them. Just a couple of minutes left in our broadcast here. It's been a fun broadcast with everybody. I'm glad you can um, you you chose to spend your time with me today. We're going to have the uh, Brooks Falls camera, this camera that we're looking at at the moment, online as much as possible um, through the fall. Just depends on solar energy. The the radio repeaters on Dumpling Mountain that send the signal from Brooks River to King Salmon are powered largely by solar energy. There's um, some ethanol fuel cells up there that help serve as a backup, but no one's there in the wintertime to replace um, the ethanol, or excuse me, methanol. It's not ethanol, but methanol. Uh, no one's there to replace it in the wintertime when those run out. So we have to be very careful about managing that energy system and also very careful about managing the solar power system that powers the Brooks Falls camera. So we try to keep these cameras on as much as as much as possible, but it really does depend on on solar energy. The River Watch camera, the Lower River camera, those are powered by the generator uh, that is attached to Brooks Lodge, and that generator will be shut off at the end of the week, probably October thirtieth. So we still have a few more days to enjoy the the views on the lower Brooks River. But get your views in now, folks. I want to remind everybody of our, our, our schedule. Next year, hopefully, we'll have some solar panels installed to help extend our bear watching season on the lower river cameras. This is certainly a season of change at Brooks River. You can see how brown the grass is. The, the life of and the abundance of summer that we enjoyed with the green grass the, the leaves on the trees, the fresh salmon arriving from the ocean and, and hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, it, it, that's, you know, coming to an end right now. Uh, everything's going into dormancy. The salmon are finishing spawning. The bears are looking for their last feeding opportunities of the year. So winter is quickly approaching, but there's still plenty of time to, uh, I think, or at least a few more days to enjoy our bears at uh, Brooks River and contemplate, you know, what they're going to do over the next several weeks and the next several months to survive until they can come back next year and, and begin the process once again. Thanks for joining me uh, on this play-by-play -play this evening. Uh, again, my name is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org. I'll be back online on the Bear, uh, the, the Brooks, uh, yes, the Brooks live chat channel tomorrow. Uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern time for a Q&A in the comments. So don't uh, listen for my voice. Just look in the comments at the bottom of the page. I'll be uh, answering your questions there, 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. And also on Wednesday, look for me on the Tundra Connections channel for the Polar Bear Cams, where I'll be joined by uh, BJ Kirschhofer from Polar Bears International. We're going to have a, a Polar Bear, Brown Bear crossover live chat. So please join me for that. That'll start at 2 p.m. on Wednesday. Have a great evening, everyone, and uh, please be well, and don't forget to vote.